All right, folks, we're going to go ahead and call our meeting to order. Thank you very much. Uh, we'll go ahead and start with the Pledge of Allegiance. And let me look around who we want to lead today. How about we have our folks uh, in the back over there lead us in the Pledge of Allegiance today? Yes, I think that would be nice. We need that. Ready, begin. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you, everyone, and have a seat. Wow, well done. Very well done. Thank you. All right, folks, we'll move on to 1.3, approval of the agenda. So moved. Second. All right, it was moved by Dr. Flores and second by Vice President Tillman. Any questions on the agenda or comments? All right, let's go ahead and vote on the agenda. It will be verbal. I'll start with Dr. Daddy Rogers. Aye. Ms. Abigail Rosas Medina. Aye. 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 And I, sorry about that, maybe we're all getting too close at the same time, yeah. so we'll, we'll kind of step back. Alrighty, folks, we are now to 2.0 closed session, 2.1 closed session public comments. I apologize, I don't have my glasses on. Should be able to read that, but just in case. This is a time that members of the public will be providing an opportunity to directly address the board about any items discussed under 2.2 um, closed session agenda. Public comments are limited to five minutes per person. Speakers are cautioned that under California law, no person is immune from liability for making intentionally false or defamatory comments regarding any person simply because these comments are made at a public meeting. Comments on any other subject matter with the board's jurisdiction may be addressed during the next regular board meeting on Tuesday, June 7th, 2022. I believe we had one public comment. Is it online or in person? Currently, we're only doing closed session public comments and I don't have any for that. We'll do public comments when we come out. All right. We'll do that when we return. So at this time, we will um, convene to closed session. Thank you. All right, folks, we're coming back out of closed session. We'll come back in session for our uh, public meeting, our workshop. And uh, there was no um, action to report out, I believe, from closed session. So we will, we'll move on to um, 3.1. As and That was 3.1. So move on to 4.0 and 4.1. Public comments, and I believe we had no public comments. Thank you, Karen. So I don't have to read that all over again, which makes that nice. And then we'll move on to 4.2, budget workshop. Uh, and that's been prepared by Ms. Applegate and uh, Mr. Solon. So we'll give it off to you two. Thank you. Thank you, Board President and Dr. Wyatt. Board Vice President, Mr. Tillman, members of the board. Um, this evening, um, staff will be presenting information on the budget and LCAP development, um, including new, um, new information related to the governor's recently uh, uh, announced May revision and um, impacts to the SBC USD budget. So here are our objectives this evening. So we want to share the info um, from the May revise, specifically education-related investments and the impact to SBC USD. We're gonna provide the board uh, with an update on one-time funding uh, as has been requested in the past, as well as highlight a few key changes that affect the LCAP and budget. And our Ed Services team will review the annual update priorities and goals for our LCAP this evening. So general takeaways from the governor's May revise. When the governor proposed the bad budget back in January, he took a more middle of the road approach when he was uh, projecting revenues. Since that time, we've seen revenues grow considerably and outpace those projections uh, set forth in January, ultimately leaving the state with a budget surplus of $49.2 billion discretionary. Um, and when I say discretionary, I mean dollars that can be used for discretionary purposes. Um, there are other surplus dollars that are put, the state puts towards debt and, and other um, required uh, uses. So what that means for education is under the test one uh, for Prop 98 funding, um, that guarantees that the um, districts 
our school districts across the state are to get the most, most advantageous funding model. And for this, this represents about a little over 38% of total general fund revenues for the district or, or for districts or $19.1 billion uh, in surplus. So as a result of those general fund revenue increases, the Prop 98 funding guarantee has risen from $102 billion, which was proposed in January, to $110.3 billion, an increase of $8.3 billion just announced in May. Yes, ma'am. So, so the general fund, 19 billion, that's the so, so so yes, so they're, they're separate. So we get a portion, well, they're not separate. So when I say 38% of general fund revenues that go into Prop 98, that includes the surplus. So of that 49.2 billion, that 38% is 19.1 billion. So that goes in, that is Prop 98. That is Prop 98. That is Prop 98. So is that about 40 million to us? Yeah, if you were to distribute on a per pupil basis, correct. Correct, and and we'll we'll walk through we'll walk through board through with just how he's allocated those resources, uh, both in one time and ongoing sources. So great questions. So um, with the additional resources, as kind of alluded to, the governor uh, provided an increase to LCFF funding via the statutory COLA. So he raised it from what he proposed in January, which was at 5.33% to 6.56%, which is the statutory COLA. In addition, the governor provided an, an additional increase to the base funding. So outside of the, the cost of living adjustment. So, and as we know, the way that supplemental and concentration grant dollars are calculated, they're calculated on the base. So anytime the base funding increases, our supplemental and concentration dollars will increase as well. Additionally, the governor, uh, sorry, the governor continues to support investments in his school transformation agenda, which we're going to recap uh, with the board in the next slide. Can I, can I yes. ask a question? Um, in, in terms of the LCFF, did something new happen where I know we always had the base funding, then you got additional funding for um, people who were, one of the categories were lower social economics, right? Correct. And then they come back and say, okay, on top of that, if you're foster youth and English language learner, that you'll get additional money? So, so great question. So the LCAP or supplemental concentration has always been for the three populations, low income, English learners, and foster youth. Mm -hmm. So um, what the way that supplemental, they, you, they provide funding for every child who falls into one of those categories in the district. For a concentration grant, they provide funding for every student above 55% in that. So while you, while you don't get concentration for every student, you do get a greater, cal or a greater rate in the concentration grant calculation. So concentration grant, um, funding actually outpaces supplemental grant funding for us. So despite the, the positive budget news, the governor is striking a cautious tone. Uh, and he cites um, several factors, including inflation, the volatility with the stock market that we've seen recently, um, as well as the war in the Ukraine, um, in addition, as well as supply and labor chain short, or labor supply shortages. So what that really means to us and what we're hearing from a lot of sources, um, we have several economic indicators that are signaling uh, a recession is on the horizon. Um, now, we've heard, we've heard that in many different um, meetings, a recession's coming, a recession's coming. We don't really know when it's coming, but the earliest we've heard that it could be predicted is uh, middle of um, 2023. So again, we don't know the degree, the severity. It could be a mild recession. It could be a more significant recession. All of that is still speculation at this time, but those are what some of those economic indicators are signaling for us. Okay. So this is a slide that we've shared with the board in the past um, several times. Um, and this is, year, this is to highlight the um, proposals for school transformation that Governor Newsom has um, taken on as part of his agenda. So we can see, you know, and I won't go through them, but you know, some of the key highlights are the Expanded Learning Opportunities Program Grant, 
um, the Universal TK program, which commences beginning in 2022-23, uh, as well as um, investments for um, Universal Meals, um, which is um, California is the first in the, the nation to offer that. Um, more, more states are following, but that's a recent change. You know, as we looked at the May revise, um, one thing that was very clear from school districts and advocates was um, the request not to provide new additional programs or categorical programs for districts to implement. We, we have a lot on our plate just with reopening schools and then on top of it, you know, expanding many program after program after program. So fortunately for us, the governor listened. And we'll talk about, you know, the ways that he listened to that in some of the proposals that he included in the May revise. So this graphic um, shows the ongoing education investments that the governor proposed. The, the uh, dark blue line uh, compared to the orange line, the orange line is the May revision uh, amount. So we can see those, those orange bars have uh, grown significantly and we have some new investments that were not previously included in the governor's January proposal. Overall, the governor's proposing $12.7 billion in ongoing investments. Um, the largest of that, representing 10 billion of that 12.7 billion, are where you start on the left-hand side of the chart, beginning with the cost of living adjustment and the ADA mitigation or, or three-year averaging uh, solutions that the governor's proposed. In addition, the governor, as I mentioned, provided additional LCFF base funding, which is that, that uh, second from the left, and then uh, growth on the expanded learning opportunities program funding. Um, again, those three categories alone represent 10 billion of the $12.7 billion proposed for ongoing investments. So next slide. Here we have the table shows the, the major investments, both ongoing and one time in the governor's May revision budget. It's important to note that the governor and the legislature are still continuing to negotiate. So any changes that are likely to occur, um, which will imp changes will likely occur and they will impact the numbers that are represented here. And um, as we move forward, once the board adopts a formal budget, any changes that comes in the ultimate state enacted budget will re be represented in a 45 day budget revision that we would bring back to the board in August. So just some of the highlights, as mentioned earlier, um, $6.2 billion was invested to increase the base um, funding. That's 2.1 billion of that 6.2 is for increase in base funding. In addition, uh, this, the increase to the 6.56 COLA as well as the ADA mitigation. So that represents the 6.2 billion in total. What that means for San Bernardino as compared to the funding that we received this year is an additional $30.7 million ongoing. Additional. additional. Yeah. So, so just to put it in perspective, um, we, we have $601 million this year. It goes up to $632 million next year. So the next one is, and this was the new proposal that wasn't in the governor's January proposal. And this goes back to his cautionary tales about the looming recession where the governor has committed that of the budget surplus at $49.2 billion um, in discretionary surplus, 94% of that is committed to one-time purposes. So he's signaling the commitment not to uh, make new ongoing commitments um, by doing so. However, uh, one of the biggest, most significant increases is an $8 billion one-time discretionary uh, grant provided to districts. And for districts like San Bernardino, that, that's approximately $60 million, one-time discretionary dollars for us. Correct. There are no strings attached. So one-time funding will roll over. Use typically, and and if you recall, um, this was this was the the tactic that Governor Brown used very frequently, providing large one-time infusions of cash for districts to use at their discretion. Just to clarify, um, just to clarify. What uh, Dr. Wyatt asks, we can roll it over if uh, if we don't uh, use it all. Yeah, it would fall. Okay. To, it would fall to fund balance. Okay. Correct. Thank okay. you. 
No problem. And so the other one that we've spoken about in the past and, and a presentation was provided previously was the Expanded Learning Opportunity Grant. This year, we received $27.8 million because of the additional uh, acceleration of investments from the governor. He's looking to fully implement it where he previously had looked to implement it over a, a three to four year period. So that funding is projected to increase to $59.6 million for those expanded learning opportunity programs. President Wyatt, I'd like to ask a question. Yes, Dr. Flores, and let me just ask real quick, Ms. Sloan, is there a break in here anywhere for questions? Or uh, I know we try to not. get through them, so I, you know, I don't want to always keep interrupting. But yeah. if there's questions that need clarification, let's do that's, it. Dr. That's fine. We can. All right, Dr. Flores. So, is this discretionary money, um, fifty-nine point six million, uh, just targeted for expanded learning opportunity programs? That's correct. This is a restricted program. A restricted program. Right. And what does that include, the Expanded Learning Opportunity Program? So uh, for what us... services are there? So we're, we're going to ha we have a slide that's going to talk a little bit about the services. Okay. Um, that's going to be presented by okay. Ann. Okay. okay. Thank you. Yes. Um, so this is like 24 point something billion dollars. So ballpark to us, like another $122 million. And this is not counting the money from ESSA, right? We still got ESSA money left over, right? You know, I, I just sense this the disconnect. So I'm, I'm glad we have the uh, folks here that do the programs. For instance, in our summer program, uh, we didn't do a sunrise at the elementary schools. Now, I know they probably say, hey, it's not regular school, but there's some parents that aren't going to participate because they can't, get their kids to school at 9.30 versus if we had the Sunrise program, we could drop them off at 7.30. And if, if our goal is to use the additional money to mitigate the circumstances of COVID, why would we spend the money or at least try to do the Sunrise program at the elementary school? Is there a reason why we didn't try to do it? So I, I will defer to Dr. Rodriguez. Is she here? Yes, the reason that we didn't get to do it this year, oh. back here is that we didn't have enough staff. So all of our vendors did not have enough staff to even totally staff the programs that we had in place. Our intent was we did have funds to be able to expand it to all of our elementary schools to get rid of waiting lists, but also to expand it at every campus. It was just that we didn't have enough people. But, but I'm talking about for the summer program. Did we ask them if they wanted to participate for the summer programs? We do have sunrise, no, we did not. We've never done sunrise before in our summer program. So no, we did not ask. To ask, it's too late to ask. Uh, I don't know if it'd be too late to ask. I'd have to defer that to Ann Pearson. Hello. Yes, summer school does start at eight o'clock, so it it's an hour earlier than normal. Okay, maybe the parents like don't know do that. that. So all the summer schools are starting at eight at the elementary schools. All right, and we, have we sent out a message to the parents, tell them that? Yes, we have it on the website, and they got messages about it as well. All right, I'll tell the parent. Thank you. Okay. All right, so in addition, um, we did receive a small increase to a special education, our base grant funding for special education programs. So that's projected to be $5 million to um, our district, and so... Um, as, as the board's aware, you know, the funding that we receive from state and federal sources for special education program is inadequate. And so uh, the district has a large contribution that we make to cover the cost of special education programs. So this is additional funding that can be used to offset the uh, contribution that the district made out of the unrestricted general fund to support. And then lastly, um, Universal TK, this funding is provided um, for uh, base grant. We, I'm sorry. So we receive funding for ADA, just like we do all of our um, other grade levels. But in addition to the ADA that we will receive from our TK expansion, we'll also receive an additional one, um, I'm sorry, add-on funding um, per ADA, which equates to about twenty hundred. $2,800 per ADA this year and is expected to increase over the next several years. And just for the clarification from the point uh, from the board, I shared the increase from the ongoing uh, investments, but for the one-time investments that were proposed in January by the uh, governor, they were a total of $4 billion. Um, 
when he announced during his May revise, those one-time investments went up to $16.8 billion. So again, signals a large portion of that surplus was being put towards one-time uses. Okay. Yes. Uh, I know you haven't gotten there yet, Mr. Sullins, but number six, seven, eight, and nine says to be determined. Um, why is that to be determined? Um, great question. So the reason those are uh, to be determined are because um, these are these are we're still waiting for budget trailer bill language, and these in particular are subjects of negotiation with the legislature. So to put in perspective, the assembly and the Senate both have their own plans uh, that differ in 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 various ways from the governor's, and so um, when we spec when we spoke with assembly member. Uh, Reyes, she indicated that right now the Senate and, Leg and Assembly are aligned and they are going to be advocating. So while the governor did propose the, these items in the May revise, there's not enough information to quantify them for what they would mean to our district, um, in, in particular because they are likely to change based on the negotiation. So are they negotiating it in budget, in the budget committee? Correct. Okay. Yeah. So when, do, when will we know? Do you know? So um, there's no... There's no timeline for that. However, the legislature has a statutory requirement to pass a budget by June 15th. Okay. So uh, they have then. not missed that because their paycheck is tied right. to that passage. Okay. So by then we should know. Correct. Yeah. Okay. All right. Thanks. Okay. Thank you. So um, as had previously been requested by the board, we wanted to provide the board with update on our uh, one-time funding. So the first slide is our federal one-time funding. Um, we, we note that the ESSER-1 funding is not included here. That is because the ESSER-1 funding is projected to be fully expended this year. Um, so remaining federal funds, ESSER-2 and ESSER-3, of the $102.3 million for ESSER-2, uh, we're projected at this point to spend $75.4 million. We have until uh, September of 2023 to fully expend these funds. If we look at ESSER 3, um, we have just under $230 million. Um, thus far, we've spent just a little over $38 million. We have additional time until September 2024 to expend these funds. The, the one thing that I would note for the board because if you look at ESSER 3 of that significant amount that we've been allocated, $38 million does not seem a lot. But we have to put it into perspective that the board approved the ESSER 3 plan in Oct late October. So um, in terms of ramping up to expend funds, um, we're making progress. As we move into the next two years, we expect that these, these expenditures will accelerate. You know, I, I it's, it's a lot of money. It's, it's a lot. Somebody else's mic. Oh, sorry. So there's a lot of money here. So um, in terms of ongoing uh, funds, so I, I just want to say, you know, because we always talk about deficit spending in a bad way, but I want to be open and transparent. In order to spend this money, you're going to do managed deficit spending. There's no way to spend this kind of money without deficit spending. Because, that's that's because, correct. Because you have the money already, so you're going to be expending more money than you're bringing in, oh, even yeah. though you're bringing in a lot of money. So the next question be, becomes, um, once we expend this um, extra money, is what the budget outlook is going to look like. So, And I bring it up because we know that we use some of this extra money to balance the budget. Correct. So we gave our pay raises with the mm -hmm. thought that, hey, we're going to use some of this one-time money, and we're just going to hope for the best. Um, past 2024, right? Correct. And our hopes came true yeah. because we did get additional money. Correct. Uh, ongoing money. Correct. So the key is going to be now to back out that money that we said we're going to use ESSER for. Correct. And use the new ongoing money and then truly spend this money as one-time money. That that That's correct and a great point, and I'm glad you brought that up. Um, you know, so when we look at these amounts, so if you look at that ESSER $2 amount, if we move some of those expenses that um, to some of our new ongoing funds to support, that ESSER expenditure amount will go down. However, we will replace them with um, additional one-time expenditures that are truly one-time in nature. So and, you're correct. And then my final thing, um, 
I may as well say here, I was going to wait to the end. But I know in the past we've given teachers a stipend. I don't know. Are we still giving the stipend we, for we, supplies? So, uh, oh, yes. Yeah, so we do still give that stipend. And I will look at increasing it because of inflation mm -hmm. so we can have the discussion later. Sure. Thank no, you. absolutely. Thank you for that. And um, just piggyback, pig, piggybacking on what Mr. Tillman said, it mm -hmm. would be nice to see where the money is going that uh, is one time mm -hmm. and how we're picking up based on the ongoing. So it would be important for us as a board to, to see the allocations uh, by category. Absolutely. I, I, I think we, sh we need that so that we can see where it is because as we, as we uh, look at the extra money that we have, you know, what are the, our priorities what are the priorities that the board is going to choose in terms of designating, you know, uh, where our goals are in terms of supporting our, our sites, supporting, uh, you know, initiatives and so forth. So uh, it would be really uh, prudent yeah. <laughs> for you to provide us that information. You know? Ab absolutely. Okay. And, and I appreciate that uh, comment as well. Um, so as we, as we, move close to closing this year's books. Um, we'll, we'll see kind of where all the funds settle. And as Mr. Tillman alluded to, if we are starting, if we do move funds out of the ESSER into these new one-time fund or these new funding sources, that's going to change. And so um, I would recommend that once that sort of settles, we can come back to the board with, with those categories and identify what are some available sources for board priorities. So great, great comment. And a lot of these will be addressed also when we go into the top 10, that maybe um, with with some of the expenditures and, and areas, but I do agree with Dr. Flores is that looking at how we can, uh, because a lot of us have our also, um, you know, some of our priorities that we want to invest money in. I know for me, it's trying to um, look at uh, mental health centers at all high school. Um, I know it's, that's more of an ongoing, but building the structure for it um, at the local level, I think it is feasible using this. But that would be something that when you bring us mm -hmm. um, those categories and how much money has been or would be spent, sure. and then aligning it also with the top 10 uh, as well. Absolutely. Thank you for that. So if we just look at the if we just look at the total of the expenditures, it looks like to date we are, uh, plan to expand about a third of the funds that we have available. So, you know, um, we still have time, so we're, we're in a good position to fully expend those funds. And we're working with our budget managers to make sure that we are expending the funds before those deadlines. So the next uh, slide is for the state one-time funding, and that's the eight state AB 86 or the expanded learning opportunities uh, grant, which is not to be confused with the Expanded Opportunities Learning Program. Um, go figure, right? So um, we received so a much... So this is additional? This is additional state okay. funding. And re if you recall, the board passed a plan um, in May of 2021 to address these funds because these funds were intended in particular to address unfinished learning. So there is a plan in place. And so of that plan... $38.3 million um, that were awarded um, for the core um, AB86 fund. We've spent just uh, under $19.5 million. We also had a separate allocation, um, which had to be 3%, I'm sorry, 10% of the total award uh, for paraprofessional support. Uh, we can see that we've spent about a third of that funding thus far. We do have um, some of these funds designated as we move towards the summer programming that these funds will continue to be expended during those programs. Yeah. So we've, we've just spent just under half of these resources um, based on this information. Um, also in the ESSER, I recall that there was $3.5 million designated for paraprofessionals. Um, okay. That number no. six in my mind. No, it's actually AB86 that you're referring to. The, pardon me? It, I'm sorry, it's this AB86 that you're referring to. 
ESSER, the ESSER three funds has a, a call out for 20% of the funds to be used for learning loss or unfinished learning. Okay, but so not that's, that's very different. Correct, okay, correct. yeah. So it was this one. Correct. Okay, correct. all right, got it. Yep. Okay. okay. Okay, and with that, I am going to turn the microphone over to Ms. Ann Pearson from our uh, director of CAPS who will talk us through the expanded learning program um, funds. Good evening. I'm okay from over here? So we um, refer to our expanded learning opportunity program funding um, as to what the state calls it as well, a dream. This is what your dream expanded learning program can be. So on this slide, you can see that in um, this school year, 21-22, we had $27.8 million. And fully funded for next year will be over $59 million. So there's a lot of dreams that can be funded with that. Some of the graphics up on that slide are just a few of the initiatives that we have going. Um, we started lifeguard training. Uh, you may or may not be aware that a certification costs a little over $200 per student, um, which is a lot of money for our kiddos. But what a great skill to have to be trained as a lifeguard because they're in constant need of them, YMCA, Red Cross, everywhere. So we've implemented that um, last month at San G, um, as well as swim instructor training and lifeguard training this summer at Cajon during their summer school. Um, some students decide to take a, a PE class during the summer, not because they're behind, but because they want another elective, so they do that. That's a lot of swimming for six hours, right? <laughs> so um, Dr. Bishop, the principal over there, had this wonderful idea once she heard about the training and saying, why not have them work for something? Um, so, sorry, that's somebody, <laughs> not me. <laughs> um, so um, what we're offering is uh, with the YMCA, partnered up with the YMCA, they're going to come out to that summer school um, swim uh, class for June and they're going to offer both lifeguard training and swim instructor training including on um, prepping because it's quite a pretest to take to um, to qualify to even take the classes so the students that have signed up for swimming over at Cajon will be doing that of course the ulterior motive is to train our kiddos here right um, so that we can hire them so then in the future we'll be able to offer swim classes um, and lifeguards for, um, in order to make sure all of our kids in San Bernardino City can swim. A um, lot of scary statistics when it comes to the number one cause of accidental death under five, which is drowning. So some of the steps we're taking to get moving on that and make our kids employable and maybe have a little more inspiration for swimming for four weeks at um, the high school. <laughs> um, also starting next year with this money, we are um, implementing Sunrise at all of our elementary schools. Um, when late start occurs a year later or so now that we have a little reprieve, um, we will be needing at the middle and high schools as well. So we're going to expand the following year. Outdoor learning, there's a lot of exciting um, projects that uh, facilities and expanded learning has talked about. Um, bringing the outside in and the inside out at several of our uh, before and after school programs. Um, we've talked about some different projects, including things I'd never heard of, like a roll-up wall where um, in the CAPS room you can be in and out at the same time, really encouraging that. Uh, and of course, we have a big emphasis on our STEAM, science, technology, engineering, and mathematics. Our summer school portion of CAPS, there is uh, two and a half hours specifically um, dedicated to that. The staff at CAPS Central have wrote lesson plans for all of that. We have a lot of interactive hands-on um, items for them to do. We have Hummingbird kits, Robotify, we have Meet the Masters. Um, we're also uh, having an entire um, Lego engineering section of it. Um, never knew all the different things you could do with uh, Legos till we went to a couple of the conferences for that. So very, a lot of exciting um, things going on. And we also have a few animaker spaces going in at Chavez and Del Vallejo, which um, look amazing and um, are things that we really feel like our um, students will benefit from. Also on June 1st, which is tomorrow, not to make any principals nervous that are watching this right now, um, we have what we call their dream plan. We made a very, um, the, 
CAP's Principals Advisory Committee um, made a very simple template for them consisting of what their dream plan was and what they needed to do to implement it, whether it was materials or teacher hours, whatever it was to do clubs. Um, and so those are due tomorrow. And just as a little sample of some of the ideas I've already seen, um, someone has a dream at one of the elementary schools where there's environmental science, and they said in a few years when they really get all the growing started with their gardens and the flowers, they want to have a farmer's market, a neighborhood farmer's market in a few years when they have enough to sustain that. And they're also talking about when they have enough flowers, they want to reach out for a florist to come and maybe start a little career pathway at the elementary school on designing um, floral arrangements using the flowers that they grow um, at their own campus. So um, it's just so exciting to see these things and these plans come in. They truly is um, dream money for expanded learning. Uh, so I think I'm just lucky that uh, I get to do like the fun slide, right? <laughs> All the exciting things that are happening and really just um, the limit is the imagination um, and really having really great buy-in with um, our expanded learning program. It's really gonna be a truly expanded part of the day now instead of just something that might've happened before or after school. And I could probably go on for a long time, so I'll stop. <laughs> Couple questions on yes, that slide. Yes, of course. Um, I believe Mr. Uh, Vice President Tillman and Dr. Flores, so, anyone else? Um, Mr. Zalas Medina, thank you. In terms of these items, have we have we've gotten input from each principal? So they're, um, we're calling it the dream plan. It's, it's that very simple template that they're going to um, turn into us hopefully by tomorrow. I've got a few entries, so that is, that is what they want to do. They're telling us what they want to do at their school site, each of the principals. So yes, Mr. Tillman, every principal has input in their program. They're actually going to work to design it. So, because this is, this is, and I don't know if this is the area or ex excluded, but for example, at uh, San Andreas, where they have the Growing Hope Growing Farm, Hope, the plant farm, they said that they had a few hundred thousand dollars. They had this thing that would be a big deal. It would fix a lot of stuff. Have they got input? Yes, we're offering it with this expanded learning opportunity program money. The schools that before were not funded with ACES or 21st Century are being funded. So they are also going to turn in that plan. Every single school has, gets to turn in that plan well, of what they'd like. Then I guess maybe my, my comments should be di uh, directed at Mr. Stoll. I just want to make sure, regardless of these categories, with this one-time money, that the sites that have these things that they want at the top of their head, that they be able to use these funding to do it. It would be a shame if they, could, if they didn't. I should go to a site and have a principal say, man, if we could just have X, because they should be able to get that right now. And I, I like the way we have these items. I looked through the, the presentation. Is there anything on here where there's an item for the cost associated with early start? With what? With the early start. I mean, the news. Yeah, whatever it's going to take to do it. Is there an item in here that talks about funding that's going to it's going to take to for us to pull off early start next year for for the late start program? Late start. No, so that would actually because that would impact the twenty three twenty four budget year. That would be information that we would provide in the coming year to prepare the board for the cost. Well, I Correct. guess my, my, right, and you're oh, right, yeah. uh, what Dr. Monars is saying, there are things that we don't have to spend money on this year in order to prepare oh, correct. for that year. Yeah. Yes. So I would like to see an item here somewhere that says, hey, we have this money, mm -hmm. and here's how we're going to facilitate late start. I was saying early start, okay. but uh, late start. I think that's important. I see your point. So um, we, we do have a, another presentation next week. So we can certainly include that information. That's a big deal. Yep. Uh, and I just wanted to add, Mr. Tillman, that with the with the ELOP funds, we do anticipate being able to support Late Start. So, for example, we're going to be working with uh, facilities in order to put in the lighting that we need after school uh, because of Late Start, meaning that, you know, our kids are going to be on campuses later, which would require more light. And so we'll be able to absorb some of those costs within our after school program money. You know, somewhere documented. Thank you. You're welcome, sir. All right, Dr. Flores. Yes. Um, Mr. Tillman, this is ongoing money. It's not one-time money. 59.6 million is 
I'm going. I'm just talking about money in general, Dr. Lewis. Okay. You're just talking about money. <laughs> I don't care what it is. Yeah. <laughs> okay. So I like that it's ongoing money. And so my question is, what are our... I know we went to hunt, uh, Mr. Tillman and I, and they showed us um, the STEAM lab. So are you seeing STEAM labs as their wish? Okay, so. We um, we um, probably have about 10 of those plans in. You know, it's a really busy time of the year right now. And um, several of them have STEAM labs or something like that for sure. Yeah. And then I'm really an advocate for VAPA. And so I wonder, you know, if we have... Um, oh, yeah. If some schools want to expand, um, you know, their music program, their uh, performing arts programs, uh, pardon me? Buying new yeah, buying new instruments um, and so forth. Uh, and then uh, I know that some schools uh, want, I, I know that some schools want to do after school ballet folklorico, right? So that's going to be part of it. So that's really great. Um, to, to add, Dr. Flores, so this last contract, our last board meeting, we did have a contract for Ballet Flocorico, so that we would that, have that yeah. at every school in our after-school program. We okay. also told the principals as part of their dream plan, they could add, we wanted them to think about, you know, in their head, what would students of affluence or uh, school districts of affluence, what kind of program would they have for their kids? You know, so uh, parents who have affluence have tutoring, they have at-home tutors, they have singing classes, piano lessons, uh, uh, dance courses, all right. after school. And so what we have looked at is how are we providing the same type of service with the money that we have to provide a comparable experience for our students in the after-school programs here? I, I was at Chavez and um, at the Heritage Festival program, and the kids uh, uh, carry around the guitars. And at, at lunch, they're forming a banda, a banda group. That's amazing. So I hope we can support that. And I think also at Arroyo, they they form their own little group. I mean, because they that's the kind of music that they like. So I, I think we should be supporting them and all of that. And, um, and some of the other things that we're trying to do is partner with like Looking Glass Studios so that our kids can be part of the Nutcracker, um, so they can be part of Junior University. So there's lots of programs that are throughout the city that we're looking forward to partnering with so that our kids have the same experiences and won't have to pay for that. It's something that the district does for them. And so we're looking at expanding yeah. all of those for them. And and that brings me to materials for art. Uh, I mean, all the different aspects of art, not just, you know, painting, right? But just, I hope that principals are, are asking for those things and teachers are too and all of that. We, have a, we have a new vendor who has an amazing program that we're starting with. And just so you know, Scott Nelson, the, I'm gonna give him a shout out, shout out the um, VAPA coordinator. Um, is already spending ELOP money, a few million already on um, new instruments and all okay, of that. Good. Um, that is already, he he made his dream plan first. He made sure he turned that in right away. <laughs> <laughs> so I know that a lot of it has already been um, ongoing. They got a new vendor. And so I know that more instruments are on their way. So that's great. Okay, thanks. Thank you so much. All right, Ms. Rosales Medina. And I'll just be really quick because I, I, I'm, I'm hoping that maybe in the district, I don't know if this, this would be district-wide, but robotics competitions, I've seen other high schools um, have that. Do we have, or unless we do have a uh, high school's robotics competition that's more of a statewide versus just the local ones? Yeah. So we do have one? Um, not that I know no, of yet. Yes, we do. Oh. We do. We actually have Sea Perch. It's a, it's a program that we have partnered with the Navy and so San Bernardino High School has gone to the finals with that. It's an underwater robot that goes through an obstacle course. And okay. so our students do participate in that. We also have some elementary schools. Uh, Marshall Elementary is one of them that also competes on a national level with that program. Okay, great. And so I guess maybe making sure that others, because I know my children would have loved participating in those, but they didn't go to San Bernardino High School. Maybe looking at how we can have it at a district-wide level for more students to participate. And then, uh, but I'm glad, or maybe even sharing with the district, because I, I haven't really seen um, having them come in with the 
um, the robotics themselves and kind of demonstrating if there's a possibility. But anyways, I, I wanted also to look at uh, school gardens. I know we you mentioned farmers market, um, and I know that could be also part of like a, kind of like a therapy counseling portion of it with mental health. So if we could look at um, school gardens, and I'm hoping that school sites are applying for it. Um, across the board they are um, we're seeing some and also with our um, facilities I believe that's been some discussion as well they've already okay great been hitting them up <laughs> okay great thank you Dr. White, just a quick, okay. uh, Dr. and Rogers. I just wanted to know are we still pairing up with Garner Holt in all of this where, where is our relationship with that work so Garner Holt is um, the two animaker spaces that we have at Chavez and um Del Vallejo, they are the ones that are putting together our Animaker Spaces. And there's um, uh, Girls in Science that's ongoing right now through the county. Um, so they, they are, there are different things that um, we're partnering with. And it really also depends on school sites. Sometimes school sites have asked for a contract with mm -hmm. them as well. Um, one of them has it in their dream plan. And well. I know in his case, I mean, definitely the more you know, the more our students will be involved. I mean, it amazes us when we go over there. And I know it was just a couple of schools or one school that had it. But at this point, especially with funding like this, we would want him to come and give a presentation about it. And I'm sure more students would be, because that's, that's the wave of the future. I mean, so we did I'm a, and I'm, uh, the voice of God again. Let me look yeah, voice. <laughs> <laughs> Good one. So we did, we did work with uh, Garner Holt and they did ask, we did ask for a proposal as we went through the RFP process. They were one of the vendors that we considered um, and I'll just keep it that way. All I have. All righty, thank you. It's funny because Dr. Rodriguez and I were texting each other about that today. They do have a summer boot camp program that's coming up, and actually the county said, let's get you guys some spots, so hopefully we can reserve some of our students for that boot camp in, in July, so thank you. All right, carrying on. All right, I don't want to be taken out of the good news train, so <laughs> one thing that I did forget to mention with, with – um, ESSER dollars that we have available, we are going to be uh, utilizing that to subsidize the um, preschool program uh, for those uh, families that do not qualify under the, um, the income guidelines. So um, we know that was a concern raised by a teacher and a parent, um, and it was board consensus that we would like to move forward with subsidizing. Those Mr. Programs. Sullen, yes. does that mean that we're starting our own preschool programs? Well, we, we, we currently have our own preschool programs, but we, we receive funding from the California State Preschool Program, but that funding is dictated on income guidelines and qualification. Right. For those families that do not qualify for, for those services, um, we would subsidize the fees that would be associated with them participating in the program. Oh, I see. Yeah. So, we, so they, will, they will participate, correct. but we subsidize the correct. fees. Okay. That's correct. And, and just to note, Dr. Flores, that would not mean that we would be able to provide uh, child care for anybody that asks because there's a limited number of spaces. Uh, so it's all dependent upon the facilities that we have and the amount of slots available. Okay, so make sure that we make that clear for parents. Sure. But that's really great that we are offering that service. That'll be really great. Thank you. Can I ask that? Um, you all are the ones in the room who help facilitate the programs. And I know it's frustrating for some parents when we do programs like um, the Broadway, I don't know what CAPS group is doing it, but we advertise to the students at these elementary schools, but we don't offer transportation. So to me, it's almost like a, something not nice to say, hey, here's this program going on, too bad you can't get there. So I hope that when we do offer the programs and we're advertising that, um, that surrounding elementary schools, that somehow we at least think about uh, facilitating transportation to these programs that we're offering. Because a lot of students in our district uh, don't have means of getting uh, the transportation. So when you, if we're going to advertise at a, a site for the program, we should only advertise if we're thinking in terms of we're going to allow transportation to come from that site or whatever their home site is. Just something to think about it's because we have the money. Mr. Tillman, just for clarity, do you, over here, right here, Dr. Monades, 
<laughs> you haven't heard my voice in a while, huh? Just for clarity in that. So are you, was it advertised um, at the district level, but it was something that was specific to a school site, and then it was almost like it was a little bit of a... There were students that, that participated. We do some type of... Uh, Broadway, Broadway. No, the elementary school, one of the elementary schools was uh-huh. like... Gomez, Ramona, I think. Ramona Alessandra, and they did this big program where, and we did give them a transportation to practice at Indian Springs. So all those kids that participated, they got a flyer saying, this summer we're going to do a Broadway clinic at, I think it's at Indian Springs and one of the school, but transportation wasn't offered. I see. Okay. Kids. Thank you. Thank you. All right, folks. I think we have about eight slides left, and they're pretty hefty slides. So if we could try to reserve our questions, write them down, if possible, as Hoping to get us out of here by 8.30, but let's see if we could do that. Thank you very much. Okay, so next slide. Um, So this is a new requirement um, that districts are going to have to condemn for for the 2022-23 school year. This is a reserve cap limit, and this was established when the state passed Proposition 98, I'm sorry, Proposition 2, which is the state rainy day fund. What it did was um, it created this cap that districts um, greater than 2,500 had to abide by um, if certain conditions were met. And those conditions that needed to be met were Prop 98 funding was sufficient to cover ADA and COLA increases, um, that we were in a test one for Prop 98 funding, that capital gains exceeded 8%. And that the maintenance factor, which is money that the state owed to school districts, had been fully repaid. And that relates back to a, a debt owed from 1415. So for 22-23, this, these all four conditions have been met. And so the reserve cap is triggered for uh, districts like ours. So what that means is um, any unrestricted assigned and unassigned balances can exceed no more than 10% of the total general fund expenditures. Um, this excludes restricted balances. There are ways that the district can contend with this. As we finalize our budget in preparation for our public hearing next week, we will identify whether we are subject to this cap. Uh, Right now, uh, based on our estimated actuals, we are projecting 13.7% for these reserves. Um, However, once we go through the 22-23 budget year, depending on our spending patterns, we may fall below that 10% and may not need to take any action. But if we did, our options are we spend down those fund balances. So as Mr. Tillman mentioned, um, plan deficit spending to bring those balances down. The board can take action to commit fund balances to um, to remove it from the calculation. And the board could do so for things like textbook adoptions, things that we are already designated a purpose for expending those funds on. Or you can transfer funds to support other priorities. So if we were looking at uh, deferred maintenance, um, providing additional contribution, you could transfer funds to support that. So those are the three options available. As we finalize our projections for the next fiscal year, we will come to the board uh, with information on what the impacts are to us, and we will have to come to a decision on which is the best uh, path to proceed on. Um, We anticipate that uh, we may be close um, to being just above it or just below it, um, but we won't know that until our budget is finalized. Okay, so more information to come. And with that, I will turn it over uh, to Ms. Kimber Sargent, who will be presenting on the uh, LCAP carryover requirement. Good evening, Dr. Wyatt, um, Vice President, Mr. Tillman, school board members, superintendent's cabinet. Um, Again, I'm Kimber Sargent, Director of Categorical Programs under the supervision of Assistant Superintendent Anna Applegate. Uh, Tonight, we will go over the new requirement for LCAP. Um, This is a carryover requirement. The carryover for LCAP is based on the district spending the supplemental and concentration funds to increase or improve services for our unduplicated students. Um, As you recall earlier in the meeting, we talked about those three student groups being our low income, English learner, and foster youth students. The requirement is to um, spend those dollars in proportion to the increase in LCFF funding as a result of that percentage. It gets pretty technical once we get into the explanation of carryover. So I'm gonna give you an example with round numbers to try and simplify this this as much as possible. 
Uh, for example, if we received $100,000 in supplemental and concentration funds and our unduplicated pupil percentage was 90%, we would need to spend $90,000 towards increasing or improving services for English learner low income and foster youth. At the end of the year, we would look at our estimated actuals, meaning how much did we um, spend or we plan to spend by the end of the year, and we would determine how close we got to that 90,000. So that, in that calculation comes up to a percentage. That percentage is called your carryover obligation. So at this time of the year, we're at the point where we have um, collaborated with our fiscal services department uh, to determine what our estimated actuals are of our supplemental and concentration funding. And for our school district, we have a carryover obligation of 7.7%. Ultimately, that does come down to a dollar amount that we need to make sure that we include in our LCAP for the 22-23 school year. So for our district, that will equate to approximately $33 million, and that will be included in the expenditures that you um, will see in our LCAP. Tonight, you do have a handout, and I might have given all mine away. Oh, I, I got it. It looks like this. Uh, this is a very simplified at a glance for you so that you can see our priorities within our LCAP. Um, at the pleasure of the board, we can give this to you definitely in more detail, but I know Mrs. Applegate will be going over some of those highlights and the process that we use this year during our LCAP annual update. Um, you will we'll use this handout when we look at the chart on the next slide. So on this chart, you'll see the amount for supplemental and concentration funding as that bottom bar on your bar graph there. So for 22-23, for supplemental and concentration funding, we have $150,981,048. Our unduplicated pupil percentage, again, that's our low-income foster youth and English learners, that percentage is over 90%. Since that's over 90%, we receive something called concentration grant add-on funding, or here is labeled as Super C, uh, just, just for ease of referencing this additional money. Uh, so that Super C funding is $26,643,714. That money has a further restriction beyond the restriction to use it for increasing and improving services for low-income foster youth and English learners that it needs to be used on personnel at the school sites to reduce the ratio of personnel to students. The last bar that you'll see on the graph here tonight um, represents that 33 million, which is our carryover obligation based on the new rule being applied. So in total, you'll see for our LCAP for 22-23, we will account for $210,760,364 during the months of essentially the day that I started in categorical. Um, up until this point, we have been in the input gathering phase with our educational partners, uh, reaching out to our parent advisory groups, our community groups, um, holding meetings with just the advisory as well as open meetings, speaking with our school site staff, including our principals, to gather input to develop a plan that reflects our local needs. Again, the items that are in that plan um, do need to be principally directed towards those three student groups. And Mrs. Applegate is gonna walk you through what our LCAP goals are. These are goals that we set over the three-year cycle for our LCAP. The input that we received for each of our three goals and then some of the highlights. President Black, can I ask a question? Go ahead, Mr. Um, just so I'm clear on the the money you're talking about. So the $177 million is what was allocated for this school year? So that would be if, if we had spent everything, we would have had $177 million in our LCAP. And is that because we received $177 million in funding for this current fiscal year? Uh, this is for the 22-23 fiscal year that we will receive this money. So, Mr. Tillman, so this year we received $169 million in uh, supplemental concentration grant. Because of the COLA, the base grant, it increases to $177.6 million for next year. And this is ongoing funding? Correct. 
And, and as of the, that money that we received, um, $33 million was unspent, she's saying. Correct. And I, yeah. I understand that's scary, but does that mean that there's a built-in shortfall of expenditures in terms of ongoing funding? That means you could hire $33 million worth of people uh, ongoing? So, so no, so it doesn't mean that. So within the LCAP, those were actions that were, those funds were designated. Those are actions that we, we did not execute. And so that funding is available. So as, and, and I'll leave it to the programmatic people, but as you look into the next year, those actions continue on because this is a three-year plan. So, so yeah, if the so plans me, are executed, the money And let me just fine. say this from a practical perspective. Uh, you know, my philosophy is that this year's money is for this year's students, right? So um, my only fear is that if you do the same thing you did this year for next year, you're going to have the same thing. You're going to have money that's unspent. And I, I looked at the items. I mean, we have too many needs in these areas for the money not to be spent. So I would just hope that someone uh, has a good feel for where the money is, that, not the money, but the areas that were documented that were supposed to be spent and didn't get spent to ensure that it doesn't get spent um, this time around. Because because now you have to spend what you the budget that you didn't spend this year, and it's been increased already. So that means you have to build in extra expenditures for next year anyway. But on top of that, you have to spend the uh, $33 million in one-time money. So as long as everybody's on the same page with that, I'm okay. So I'm, I'm going to let Ms. Applegate uh, um, com comment in a second. But yes, I, I get say the pleasure that, of speaking to that. Yeah, and, and that's, I would just add that that's exactly the problem we don't want to have because it is very challenging. So, Mr. Tillman, this year we had some dollars that were unspent. Um, fortunately, the county has been more strict with us about saying you can't bundle money and put it aside anymore. You need to move forward. So I'm going to share with you an ambitious but very, very good plan for support to the sites. But let me go back to remind us of our LCAP goals. And I think what I liked about the county, we spent about four hours with them last week unbundling and they want details and they want specifics, which makes it easier than for us to keep metrics to see if things are working or not. It's not just one big bundle of money. So if we go back to our LCAP goals, you know we have three goals around academic achievement, school climate and campus environment, and then student and family and community engagement. Those three goals remain the same. And all the input that we got from all stakeholders, our teachers, um, managers, parents, everybody that um, inputted for the LCAP, they kept coming up with the same thing, that the schools need more support. The schools need more support. So that was overwhelmingly obvious to us. So as we went in with the county to rewrite the LCAP and to unbundle some of the things that we had, there are some very specific things in here that I will share with you. So the goal around academic achievement, as you know, we are very, very highly concerned about recapturing learning. That's number one. We need to make sure that our learning for students is accelerated because we know they need two years to make up. And so we have to be very creative and very ambitious. We know that um, along with that, we have some goals around A through G, STEAM, career pathways, vocational opportunities. We want to open up all of that to our, to our students. And there's going to be a huge push for early literacy. We know that our three-year-olds, our four-year-olds, our five-year-olds are coming to us and they have great gaps and great needs. So we're going to really have an ambitious plan for early literacy as well. Goal number two, I know that Ms. Medina mentioned, uh, Rosales Medina mentioned about SEL and wellness centers. Dr. Rodriguez is in talks with all of us and there are great plans to have on those wraparound services so that we're looking at the whole child because we know that a lot was lost, not just the academics. So we're very focused on that. And you'll see some of that as I go through the LCAP. We want to really help with our community partners. They are there for us and they're telling us, tell us what you want us to do. So we're committed to working with our community partners and our students and our families to help us. Uh, as we know, again, so it's a total wraparound of our students. So we're really taking advantage of all of that. So some of the input that was gathered through the LCAP process, uh, much of that revolved around intervention. Our parents said our kids need intervention. They need help with further learning, especially in ELA math and English language development. As you know, we have over 10,000 English learners. That's larger than some districts. And research, I'm sorry, data shows that our English learners took probably the hardest hit of all, as you can expect with distance learning and language. So that's a huge need that we know that we need to address. So we're gonna be very strategic about that as well. 
And then again, with the school climate, attendance. That's a huge red flag for us. Attendance. We need to recapture our kids. We need to do whatever we need to do and be creative and, and deliberate about it. So you'll hear a little bit more what the plans are there. Counselors, social, emotional, well-being, and mental health. Kate was resounding with our families. Our parents said our kids need more support services in the term of, uh, in the way of counseling and mental health. So there are plans for that as well. Community involvement, we talked about our parents were very adamant about translation and interpretation and people to help them, to, to teach them how to get on computers, to do workshops on how some of these programs are helping their students. They want to be involved in their child's education and they want to help recapture the learning. So they've told us that they want more workshops and more training on all the different intervention programs that we have. And again, as, as uh, Mr. Sullins mentioned, the board will also have the opportunity for you to tell us what your priorities and funding are if you don't see them here. So as we move in, I'm going to be very specific um, with the next slide to tell you what some of the plans are. So as we sat with the county, we realized that we had to be more detailed about what we were doing and attaching the dollar amounts and making sure that it aligns with our goals. So I want you to take a look at this, this plan that we have. It's not necessarily new, but it's decentralized. We've taken these positions that, were come, that came before you. Uh, as centrally located positions, and we are pushing them out to the school sites because we realize that having the people at the school sites is what we need to do. And you saw that portion in the LCAP that is actually dedicated to reducing the ratios at the school site with personnel. So this is something that we feel uh, very confident about. We're talking about providing an intervention or an MTSS coordinator or coach at every single school. That person would be the person that would know what all the resources are for SEL, mental health, behavioral health, academics, that would be a person that can then, you know, work with families and give all the resources and supports at the school that the student would need. They'd be looking at data, they'd be making decisions about the tiers of support. We are really big on the multi-tiered system of support. That's something that we are really trying to get in place to make sure that we have fundamentally tier one for all of our kids and then add on the resources. And I'll speak a little bit to, uh, more about that in a minute. We also talked about resident guest teachers increasing that. Dr. Funtus and his team have done a fantastic job hiring over, I want to say close to 300 now, Dr. Funtus. I don't know the, the guest teacher. Over 500 <laughs> positions that Dr. Funtus and his team have provided with resident guest subs. And that's important because we now have resident guest subs that stay at the school the entire year as their person. And they're being trained by my team in literacy, in math, and whatever is needed at the school site. And so they become a, a part of that staff. So we, we have plans for that as well to continue that and expand it. We talked about the libraries now, um, uh, multicultural libraries and, and different um, ways that the students can see themselves in classroom libraries and district-wide providing more resources for the schools. We really, really want to push with tutoring, in-home tutoring. We made an attempt with a couple of tutors, but I know that Dr. Valdez has a couple that are really good. And we know that Again, like she said, having a tutor come to your house is huge for our kids. So investing in these contracts with vendors to come in and provide tutoring for our students. Because our teachers, let's face it, they, they are helping as much as they can, but they want their vacation and they get tired. So we have the money to contract out and make sure that we have people to tutor our kids. And we brought back field trips, academic and college field trips. Every school site will be getting money for field trips so kids, kids can have that experience. We also have instructional aids in all the TKs. You know we have a TK expansion. We're going to add instructional aids to all those TKs. All, this, all the focus schools, all the schools that have been identified as improvement schools, will be getting instructional aids and educational assistance at the school sites. For counselors, we know that a school that has 300 kids has one counselor, elementary level. An elementary school with 700 kids has one counselor. That's not equitable. So we're going to add counselors to the higher number elementary schools so that they will have, um, they'll be able to take more students. We added 10 foreign language teachers at the high school level. You made a commitment to make sure that our kids have that opportunity. Every one of our middle school now has foreign language, except one or two, I believe. All of the high schools now, so there'll be 10 additional foreign language teachers. And so we're excited about that. We were able to keep teachers that, uh, we didn't cut any teachers, regardless of class size. We made a commitment to make sure that we stabilize this next year. We know hopefully enrollment will stabilize and we'll, we'll get better enrollment. And all those teachers were kept at the school sites. And so they'll be able to help with learning loss as well. So there are many, many things, as you can see, that um, we've been doing. I know Dr. Rodriguez has contracts with social workers. We're going to add an attendance verifier to every single school. We're going to add a health aid to every single school. I know Dr. Rodriguez is also um, hiring, uh, I mentioned social workers, but she's also have contracts out for mental and behavioral health support. 
And that's really um, expanded. And so now that person that's the MTSS person at the school site will have access to those resources so that all of our principals, principals will be able to offer that to our students. So there are quite a few things that are going on. And I wanna go back to the whole MTSS um, concept. If we approach funding and we approach instruction in that multi-tiered system of support way, it's time that we identified tier one for all of our kids. It can't be based on who you know. If you know that person and you ask for an extra teacher and maybe you get it, or you know that director and you ask for an instructional aid and they pay for it, that's not how we should be doing business. Tier one for all of our kids, everybody, the health aid, the attendance verifier, the extra MTS, that's base program for everybody and we commit to that. Then tier two, the schools like that are the focus schools, then we add more. We add more support. That's what equity is all about. Tier three, adding that. But the beauty of that too is that as you know, right now we have, there's money coming everywhere. But you also see the trend that it kind of labels off and in the past, oh, now we got to cut 25 million. The beauty of, of approaching it in a tiered system of support, you've identified tier one. As you peel off the layers, as the money dries off, you don't touch tier one. You start peeling off all the extras and then everybody still continues to get that equitable education. So we need to have that approach so that everybody has that quality education and we add as, as we see the need. So we are looking at the data, making sure that all these actions are aligned with what we need to do, but they are centered at the site. And so you will hear more about the plan and I know as, as we take it forth to the county and hope for approval, we're excited and I think, I think our staff will be excited to see the, all the support that will be coming to them at their schools. Dr. Wright. And the, the list that you have in front of you, we, we will further unbundle that because you can see here, like I think action 1.20 still says academic student support or direct student support. These are some of the positions I was talking about. So they've all been accounted for and these are ongoing dollars. So we don't have to be in fear so much of, of adding some of the support that we're adding to the school sites. I will say that, however, adding all these positions to the school site, we may ask for a couple here and there that we might need downtown to support all of this work but we will bring that to you at a later time. I'm just letting you know that might be a possibility. All right, can we get through next steps and timeline? We have two, looks like two quick slides. Is that okay? All right. Okay, thank you. Okay, we'll, we won't spend too much time on here. So next steps really in the budget process, we talked a bit about budget committee hearings are ongoing. Um, ultimately, the legislature needs to vote on a, and approve a budget as of June 15th. Otherwise, their, their paycheck is withheld. Um, and then ultimately, after negotiations carry forward, uh, the governor should adopt a budget. Um, if you recall last year, there was a shell budget adopted at June 15th so they could retain their paycheck. Um, and ultimately, negotiations carried on until we received a, an approved budget from the governor. Um, correct. And um, for, um, for our district, um, we are going to continue to update assumptions as necessary as we continue to receive information. We have our public hearing for both budget and LCAP. And I should say LCAP and budget because LCAP always has to be um, presented and approved first. Um, LCAP and budget on June 7th. And then we will bring back um, to the board for adoption the 22-23 LCAP and budget on June 21st. And then once we've gone through the budget adoption cycle, um, we, we still have steps that come uh, forward related to the budget. Um, we will come back to the board in July to review the priorities and new state dollars that were received as of the enacted state budget. Um, as mentioned earlier, we'll come back in August with any 45 revisions in the 45 day budget revision. And then as we move closer to October, um, that's when academic achievement, expenditure uh, data, and reports um, should be available. And then we'll move into the first interim uh, LCAP and academic updates in December. And so with that, All yeah, righty. Thank you. thank you, Mr. Sohn and staff. That was quite a report, so and a lot of information. And we'll move back over to Dr. Flores and Ms. Ceballos, I believe. Uh, yes. Um, thank you, uh, everyone, and especially um, Ms. Applegate for uh, delineating all of this uh, because uh, when we talk about equity, um, I just wanna comment that the fact that every, every site is going to be um, given all these services, that's really uh, a great step forward. I, I really appreciate that very, very much. And um, 
you know, we always talk about attendance and chronic absenteeism, and we do need those, uh, you know, attendance verifiers, but also the mental health, the counselors, the health aides, the nurses. And um, I, you know, I, I, I've asked teachers that have retired, and I said, if there was one thing that you would have wanted more of, you know what they said? A paraprofessional. A paraprofessional to be another body to be in the classroom. Uh, and if you think about it, you know, our teachers are incredible. They have so many uh, ranges of ability and also special needs. Also, I mean, and just to have one more adult in there makes a big difference. And, and then plus extra ones that you're saying for literacy and math. Uh, and um, so I, I appreciate that. I also appreciate that um, we have, um, you know, attending to smaller class sizes. I hope that those are targeted towards, um, you know, our, our um, coming through the pandemic, uh, our kids have lost a lot uh, because of, of the situation. So I think the lower class size will be great in terms of also, I worry about our fourth, fifth, and sixth graders, and also everybody, our middle schoolers and also the high schoolers. But, I, I, but that's crucial, that, um, that, that intermediate age is really, really crucial. So I hope that you're targeting uh, that for smaller class sizes as well and wherever we can, uh, because this board has approved smaller class sizes um, in the past. Ms. Avios, we, 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 uh, we've done that before for high school and also middle school and uh, where we had the money. And I also appreciate, Ms. Applegate, what you said about tier one and then tier two and tier three. As the money subsides, everybody gets tier one. And that's really important. And that's best first teaching uh, for our kids. And um, so uh, thank you very much. I really uh, commend all of you for, um, for, you know, for the specificity and the targeting across our goals and then seeing programmatically how all of the expenditures are going to go out. And that's, and that's, you know, the money should be spent, like you said, Mr. Tillman, on that year for, for our kids. So um, greatly appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Flores. Ms. Ceballos? Thank you so much um, for all of the great information. I was really excited to hear um, everybody's presentation, but more so your part of the presentation because I'm a huge um, advocate and proponent of, of the multi-tier systems of support, um, as, as you all know. Um, and so I just have a question about, well, first I'll start with a concern of mine, um, and that's like the accountability piece, right? So um, I'm, I'm really interested in, in one of the things that um, why I was really behind um, Mr. Irvin's uh, framework of, of, you know, excellence is because it really broke down the district into smaller, more manageable pieces, um, which in turn meant uh, more accountability, right? Because we are a huge district and it's very easy to get lost um, in knowing who all we employ and what all do they do, right? Um, and a great example of, of, of that would be like a paraprofessional or in some cases like even let's say 101, a good example would be like a 101 for a, a student in a special education, right? If a one-to-one -one, um, aid is provided to a student in special education, sometimes that one-to-one -one aid is contracted, right? Or even our after-school um, CAPS people, they're contracted out. And so sometimes they don't know who their immediate supervisor is or who they need to reach out for support when they do need it. And so um, I guess that's like one of the biggest concerns that I have that we want to make sure that, you know, yes, we add these, you know, positions and things like that, but that, that accountability piece is really, we're really um, keeping that in mind, that peace in mind.
And thank you so much for that. And I, I completely understand and I agree with you. We are continuing to work in clusters. That's not going to go away. So the difference is that instead of these people being downtown, they're going to be at the schools. But it's still very much the same type of a delivery where we're giving direct services to kids, but even more because they're going to be housed at the school sites. We will continue in clusters. We will continue with the accountability that we would have done before. And I think um, the training is what we will house downtown, which is why I was saying that maybe we might need a couple of positions because, yes, we're going to put all these people at the sites, but we want them highly trained and highly qualified. So then that continues to fall on us to make sure that they're trained. One of the reasons why the resident um, sub guest teacher program was so successful, and why, when I say successful, is because we do surveys, we, we uh, have um, feedback that they gave us, and they tell us, I really felt like I was effective because I was trained on how to teach reading. Big difference than just putting a sub teacher out without any training. So we will continue to do that type of training, but the people will be at the site. We're still clustering, so that's not going to change. And by the way, the, the overarching goals, the five goals, academic achievement, college and career, SEL, health and safety, and family and community engagement, that doesn't change. That's still, that came from our community, and that's what they want. So we will continue to do that. We'll just be more aligned, and the dollars will be going directly to the schools and to personnel to lower some of those ratios. Awesome. So again, I am really excited to hear that. Um, and as we move forward, again, I'm going to just just FYI, I guess, going to be looking for that accountability piece um, of it, because I tell you too many times, I, even in even in, you know, my work area, too many times we have um, additional people come on board and sometimes they're completely clueless, not because they don't know what they're doing, but because that leadership component or that direct, you know, direction um, that they that they need is not there readily available to them. Um, and then and then the other um piece that I wanted to ask about was um, how is the um, general education piece of the MTSS component working together um, with the special education department? Because again, um, one of the things that I often see is one of two things. Sometimes schools and schools dis school districts will utilize special education as their tier two intervention, <laughs> right? Um, tier or three, actually. Huh? Tier three, actually, but yeah, it's not. <laughs> well, well, tier two, I mean, in, in even worse cases, because they don't have that smaller um, setting to be able to provide that tier two intervention. And so oftentimes they're utilizing that RSP pullout um, as their tier two intervention support. Um, and so I guess my question is, how is um, the district working, um, you know, in, in bringing together and aligning both special education and the general um, education, you know, teams um, in working together th together through those processes when there's obviously different routes to special education assessment. You have on the one end parents that can re directly request, you know, the assessment. And then at that point, you kind of are left with kind of jumping all of those processes but then on the other hand, you know, if a parent doesn't request it right away and a teacher wants to initiate it, sometimes, sometimes the MTSC, MTSS process is not as clear to the teachers. And so they're often left with having to contact parents on the down low, if you will, and, and advising them, hey, you know, because I'm needing the help, there's usually more barriers for me. But if you come and request the assessment, then, you know, the school has to respond within 15 days and so forth. So how are we? Um, so I think the most important thing, the MTSS, the multi-tiered system of support, is the structure to provide the instruction. The process you're talking about is the SST. That's the paperwork and the identification moving forward toward testing. If you have a very high quality, very well done, multi-tiered system of support, then tier one is appropriate for all kids. We just make modifications depending. So we make modifications for ELs. We make modifications for our advanced learners. But the key is that you identify the, the standards, the power standards for that grade level, whatever instruction needs to take place. And if you're really good at that, and the teachers understand that very well, they do that with their special education students too. They just provide accommodations. If they're not successful there, then they move to tier two. The problem is that tier one has not been as clear. We've really spent the entire year working with our principals and with our teachers to identify what is the essential instruction for all of our kids, regardless of who they are. 
We just need to make some modifications. And if they need further assistance, they go into tier two. After tier one, when they go into tier two, that's when we start looking at the SST process. Now that's all the paperwork that we have to do to say they're not making it, so what are we gonna do? And we provide intervention, and we progress monitor, and we look to see if they're making progress. If they're not, we go another tier. That's still not special ed identification, as you know. But that's more intensive, possibly one-on-one, -on -one, possibly contracted services, whatever it takes. Once that doesn't happen, then and only then do they get referred, depending on what the teams decide. So if you don't have a well-organized structure of instruction, that's why that happens, because people don't recognize what they should be doing in tier one, and they push quickly. They're not learning, oh, let's push them through. But we need to be very good, and we spent the entire year with our principals talking about tier one, our curriculum guides. You know, if teachers, if I'm a third grade teacher, here are my standards, I know exactly what I need to teach, I have the autonomy to do it the way I want to do it, but now I know these are the power standards I have to teach to make sure that the kids are on level. So just to clarify then, does this um, plan, is it targeting more so the tier, like the tier one aspect of the All the tiers. Okay. So, so tier one, for, for our kids, we know that attendance is tier one for all of our kids because we've had such loss. But then there are those that we saw through the data that had severe chronic absenteeism. Now that's tier two. And so maybe tier three, a one-on-one -on -one or a contract or something like that. So all of our kids right now, um, we have that upside down triangle where we have more problems within tier one. That's what we're trying to fix right now. Because but, once we get that down well, and then you know, kids don't fall through the cracks as much. So let me add to that. Um, part, of what we, what, part of the work that we've also been trying to do over the last year is to have more integration between what happens in ed services and what happens in student services as far as special education and providing additional supports for students who have need. And so I'll give you an example of one of the ways um, kind of looking at the over-identification of special education students. So for example, um, this past year, we partnered with special ed to loan out a CB or BCBA. Um, to be able to look at some of those students who have not been identified as special education students, but are having behaviors in a classroom. Uh, behaviors that are so much that a teacher is not able to, with their interventions, not able to provide the support that that student needs. That student continues to be in general ed, provides, we provide that service through um, the uh, BCBA. We provide additional intervention and uh, support through like check-in, check-out model. Um, Next year, as part of this plan, uh, Positive Youth Development will have their own CBC, uh, BCBA um, that is for specifically general education students so that we can provide those services so that they are not then referred to special education because there are programs and support for gen ed kids that don't necessarily need to have that extra support. So part of the work that we're also trying to do on the instructional side is provide teachers through tier one additional interventions and support for behavior and academics so that they can build in those structures for students in tier one. So for example, if let's say a student is not learning um, you know, multisyllabic words. Just because a student doesn't know how to do that doesn't mean that they would automatically refer them to an SST or special education. Perhaps the teacher needs additional training to be able to um, work with students that are having that difficulty. And maybe they need additional strategies like uh, centers, for example, or more time with the teacher. And so those things are being built into the tier one so that there isn't as many students being referred into uh, special education programming. Just had one last thing. Professional development looks totally different. So my team, along with, with um, Dr. Rodriguez's team, Dr. Esquivel's team, they're planning together now because we had, we had over 172 different professional developments. Well, if you're a teacher coming back from this pandemic, you're trying to get your class back, that's a lot of time to be out of the classroom. So we're, we're having an approach where it's collaborative between the divisions. If we do a PD on math, we get somebody from Sandra's division on behavior and SEL and infusing some of those strategies. Mr. Ocosta or Mr. Ojeda give us somebody to tell us these are great EL strategies. And we approach that collectively so that we're not killing our teachers, pulling them out of the classroom right and left. So that's changed also the way we do professional development. We're embedding and we're helping teachers to get better working with all of our different student groups. Well, again, I appreciate. Um, Thank the, you. Very good questions. I, I know that it was a long response, but I, I will definitely um, be interested to continue to, you know, have this information presented to the board, maybe on a more um, frequent basis. 
in terms of what are the tier ones, tier tier two and tier three and how the two are working together. Thank you. All right, Mr. Bowles, uh, Mr. Tillman and Dr. Daddy Rogers. Thank you. Um, I want to uh, commend um, Dr. Funches. You show you hired 500 people, which is pretty amazing. But I, I want to thank the board too for approving the pay raises and giving the benefits because you know as well as I do, it's a competition out there. So people are looking at pay right now and benefits to determine what school districts they're going to go to, and that's going to continue. I know you probably still having challenges getting people, but those things do make a big difference. It is them, right? Yep. Okay. And then um, in terms of the, um, the, the one big issue I have at the high school level, and I, I talked to um, – uh, Mr. Irvin about it and some other staff in the district, but it may be, I'm, I hope I'm off base, but it seems like there are um, students that hang out at the high schools and aren't engaged. Are we working on that? Are we, are, can we, can I be assured that um, I don't have the same group of students not going to class at a high school every day, day in and day out without personnel contacting them and trying to find some way to engage them to ensure they get an education or be offered some other uh, option. And, and, and not the term I was heard was sometimes the younger kids, they say they're going to let those kids age out so they can go to a uh, continuation school so they're just allowed to linger at sites. Hello? Okay. No, that is not what we want, and that's our intent with lowering the ratios. We're bringing the extra personnel to the to the school sites to help with that. And and are, we, the, are we able to hire the extra personnel? Yes, this is what this is what is in the plan, and that's what we want to do. Okay. I know we'll probably kill Dr. Funches over there, but yes, we do <laughs> want to bring to lower the ratio to have more of a personal touch. And those health health I'm sorry, the attendance verifiers and the attendance, I forget what the other technicians are the ones that will be going out to the homes, contacting, making kids, making sure kids well, are in classrooms and those things. Yeah, but my point is you don't have to go to the homes. They're at the site, not going to class. Yeah, well, and they'll get them from the sites as well. So, so we've, we've talked about that. I know Dr. Rodriguez was working on that as well. So part of what we're talking about here is changing the way that our high schools deliver instruction, as well as keeping kids interested and engaged so that they will want to come to class. And so the traditional model of the lecture or you know a teacher who just kicks them out needs to change. And so while we don't have that answer, I think that's something that we continue to look to see how we can change that. Um, that goes to culture. It goes to uh, professional development for our teachers. But it also at the core is the social emotional learning that kids feel a connection at school and that they have a connection with an adult who will help them and, and guide them with mentorship, et cetera, to keep them to go into class. But I think, you know, with one of the things that we've been doing is working on the instructional practice so that class isn't boring. We know that if class is boring, kids are not going to want to go. Because I, I really uh, want to emphasize, I think we should, you know, not try to reinvent the wheel. I know... I only go to CSBA uh, as, or maybe one other conference, but, but you all go to educational conference all the time. So there has to be somebody out there talking about having this problem and there's a program that works best for those students that have habitually been hanging out on campus at a high school level and how they were able to engage them and get the results. Because you can even spend one-time money on programs like that. So I hope we're looking at doing that. I know at the conferences I've been to, a lot of those been um, – programs that focus on, they call it uh, chronic absenteeism, but the programs actually contact the students, go to the homes, uh, find out what the barriers are, um, do all those type of things. So I hope we're looking at spending some of this money on those type of issues. Yes, sir. Thank you. And, and Mr. Tillman, just to Hello? Okay. <laughs> Remember the parent that came from San Bernardino High School? The yes. next day, we sent staff out, and I know their staff was heightened, their, their awareness was highly heightened, I guess I should say. I drove by the next day, there was not one student out on campus, not Great. one. That's what I'm talking so about. So just a deliberate <laughs> effort like that helps. But the long term, as Dr. Rodriguez says, is engaging them. But we did get them all back in class. Thank you. All right, Dr. Daddy Rogers. Thank you, and I'll be brief. 
I, I wrote down here people too, because I keep hearing it over and over again. And this is truly going to take people for sure, for sure. But I also, in, in addition to what you were saying, I wrote down safety too, because I didn't hear a lot about, I know it's one of the slides talked about climate and then it said safe environments, but we really have to spell that out for our parents, for our community, because right now everybody is coming up with all, you know, from walls to whatever, but we have to explain to them that, you know, this is, these are our children. We're not going to create prisons or anything like that, but we also got to let the community know what are we going to do? What are we really going to do? Even talking about the hanging out, that's unsafe. And we know just recently, what was it like? 14 individuals were unfortunately shot and that was young people out at a hookah bar. So there's got to be some education and some assistance. When we talk about talking with our parents, we really need to explore what drugs are really doing. Now, fentanyl is killing instantly, not later, but instantly. So, you know, more, more of the conversation on safety versus saying we're going to lock them up and throw away the key. They need to hear that. And I didn't hear much of it tonight and all the money and everything that we were talking about. We got to do that. The other thing was financial literacy. I know we talked about that before, but that's another huge thing that even legislators are pushing. So while we have, and I know we mentioned it probably a couple board meetings ago, but we really need to say what we're doing because that's also helping our students understand the future of finances and all of those things that, that go along with making money. What are you going to do with the money? And then when um, we were talking about the kids hanging out, I, I couldn't believe it. I had a, a Cal State graduate was sharing with me, convincing me the importance of gaming and what it does. And I didn't hear that either. Um, and, and the fact that it's hand-eye coordination is more than just, you know, just sitting here in front of this, this electronic device, which I usually would say, this is wasting time, but it's not. I see the other side. So I hope we're looking at that and encouraging kids to create apps. And we never know what we may get out of this. And those are the things from this young man, as he was explaining to me, what keeps him around, you know. And I, I went to the um, our Native American graduation. And it was a student that was sharing with me that he wasn't sure about what he was going to do. And at the same time, si simultaneously, I, I said, well, what are you interested in? I said gaming. He said gaming. And so how wonderful it would be if we can connect them to those things. And then um, before I didn't hear, I heard we talked about mental health, but I don't even know if our district is doing, has done mental health first aid. I remember two years ago or prior to COVID, that was supposed to be everyone. Everyone was supposed to do uh, mental health first aid, just like first aid. And it really is an uh, eye opener as to think you don't have to be a professional but you have those basic skills to identify what is happening with that student. So I would like to revisit that to find out what we've done in the capacity of mental health first aid is free. It doesn't cost anything other than your time to do it. And then lastly, Jingo, I'm saying it Jingo because I don't know whether or not, what other name to call it. And whether we liked it or not, it was an entry way for our students to do internships and to connect right here in our community. And again, there's money, but there's, there must be a reason to spend it correctly. And I know down the stretch before COVID, we had to come up with a half a million dollars to continue that program because something went awry with the county or whatever the... The what, protocols what, were something happened. What was it called? Generation Go. Go. Oh. Gen Generation, Generation Go. Go. So I hope that we reconnect on that and find out what we need to do. And if the county, no, they don't have to pay for it for us. We have the funding and money to do it. So I, I would like to see us revisit or talk more about those opportunities for our students as well. And those are my comments. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Daddy Rogers. Dr. Flores. Um, I forgot to mention again the mariachi. Um, I wonder what the update is. Does anyone know about our our district mariachi at all? I thought we had. Didn't we have an update recently? Yes, it was, there was did, mariachi. Right? I can't remember which school it was, but it, it disbanded before COVID. Was that I think the Friday that update? Our, Yes, we put, was, uh, huh? we put an update. I didn't see that on the Friday. It was. it was a few weeks back. I can, I can get yeah, it for you. There was, a, there was a program at Lancashire, I believe. And so they, uh, Scott Nelson is putting together uh, programming so that we can bring Beth the Mariachi to the elementary schools. Um, that was in the Friday update. How long ago was that, I wonder? 
But I, it was just, it's a, just an update, but what's the status of it? And I mean, if it's just while well, he's bringing it together, what's the money? Uh, what's the plan? You know, uh, is it just one? Are we going to do it? You know, I, I'm, I, no, there, there's no I, issue with money, Dr. About Flores. This for five years. Yeah. Yeah. No, they, they disbanded because they, yeah. uh, two of the kids um, were out. So it's not a money issue. We'll, we'll pursue that and we'll make sure that we okay. reach out to them again. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Flores. Absolutely. Ms. Rosales Medina? All right. Thank you very much. And everybody's asked all my questions, but I was thinking about doing it again. I'm just kidding. Uh, no, you know I won't do that. But no, folks, uh, great presentation, a lot of information, a lot of money. Um, so, uh, you know, I think our next uh, activity, which I'll make very quick uh, as a board, we could st definitely start looking at some items and prioritizing, um, even like things you just mentioned, Dr. Flores. I I'm super excited about that, just so you know. Many programs, many programs, absolutely. That's just one of many. Um, but I believe Mr. Son just had a quick closing comment, and then we'll go on to our next activity. Absolutely. But thank you, team, again. Great job. So I wanted to, I just wanted to thank the board for the time and attention this evening. Um, but I would be remiss if I did acknowledge, did not acknowledge uh, several people. So uh, Tris Huey and the fiscal services team who have been working very hard. Okay. So, um, Ms. Kimber Sargent and the categorical team as well have been working hard. And Pearson's uh, with the ELOP funds, a lot of hard work. And I really, I really do want to say that this is a cross-divisional effort. Uh, we are over a billion dollar budget. And so that, that's no small potatoes. And it really takes everybody's involvement to come up with these plans and ideas to present to the board that really represent the needs of our communities and educational partners. So I want to thank all of my colleagues and uh, their divisions for all their hard work because it doesn't happen with one person. Well, Mr. Son, I couldn't ask for a better segue into our next activity. And, and again, an amazing job. And, and uh, folks, board, you know, um, we've, we've talked about the board top 10 for quite some time. And it was a, I thought it was a really good tool that we had in the past. And, uh, you know, I had um, Karen pull up our last um, time we documented. And if you look, it was back in 2020. June of, um, it looks like about June of 2020, somewhere around there. Actually, April 2000. Yeah, June, April 2020 in that time range. And, um, you know, I know there's been a lot of concerns that have come up over the last couple of years about, you know, this is what we want to do. Can we do this? And it's been very difficult with COVID. I think we all know that, that, you know, our top priority for about the last two years has really been safety, um, you know, and trying to maintain a high level of rigor uh, and excellence with teaching our, our scholars and working with our staff, but maintaining safety at the forefront to ensure that everybody is okay. Um, it's put a high level of stress on all of us, as we've known. It's worn us down tremendously, um, probably heightened a lot of different uh, emotion, uh, emotions in us that we normally wouldn't like. Uh, you know, I think we've seen that. But at the same time, you know, we're starting to see, I think, that light at the end of the tunnel coming out of this. Um, we know COVID is still very present, still very dangerous, and we need to be careful. Uh, but at the same time, we need to focus on our goals, as we just saw in this great ILCAP presentation, and us as a board together collectively on moving this district forward. I know we've had conversations about this, and, um, but it's time to put the, the rubber on the road, to put our top priorities that we see as individual board members, then to come together collectively and identify at least 10 top priorities. Um, I had Ms. Cunningham give you a copy of what we had two years ago. It's pretty interesting to look at because, boy, have times changed in two years. I'm sure all of you are looking at this going, well, heck, we've done half these things, if not more, and that's not really that important anymore when it was a top 10 just two years ago. So really think about that when you look at the list. And then also the, um, she gave us the list of the board ongoing, what was it? Let me make sure I say the right one because I have more than board, uh, board ongoing initiative reports. And um, even when I looked at those, I checked off like half of them saying, I don't really think we need those reports anymore. So we kind of talked about it earlier. I think, yeah, they have. And that's fantastic because that's what we were hoping for. And I think we've sometimes lose sight of, well, we want to do all these great things. Mr. Tillman was talking about earlier. They're already done. And these were top tens and in ongoing initiatives just two years ago that we've accomplished as a district. So please think about that and applaud yourselves, all of you, this board and our district, on getting those things done between COVID and now. 
right? And our, well, that's not even the district. I mean, everybody. All of us uh, collu uh, inclusively, collectively getting this done. So the question to ask now is, well, what's our next priorities moving forward? And I've heard a lot of them from, that's why I didn't ask any more questions, because I was like, oh, they're asking them all right now. And, you know, coming up with all these great ideas with our, with our executive cabinet team. And I'm like, yep, yep, you're going to get a chance to put that on paper here very soon. So please look at the um, top 10 we had, which again, probably aren't our top 10 anymore. Look at our board ongoing initiative reports that we've accomplished a lot of those. If you need more information, I can have um, Ms. Cunningham even send you more reports, which was uh, our future agenda items. And um, I think there was one other report, but I didn't really want to convolute everything right now because I want us to kind of put some stuff down on paper. As you can see, we have a board top 10 worksheet, about as simple as it comes, right? Five straight lines on there. Might want to put your name on there, though. We need something for our name so we know who we are. Um, I already did four while everybody was talking because I was listening to your ideas and saying, well, I like that one, I like that one. I'm going to modify that one. So as you can see, I've already put four on here. I will say this, none of them are on the top 10 that we used to have. Not a single one. So I'm thinking we need to look forward look in advance and what it is we may want to do. And, um, but even though I just put one on here, it's, it's one that I think we all want. And I'll just give you an example, like implement wellness centers at all high schools, right? I think we're doing that. If we haven't fully done that, committed to it, then that was, did you? Thank God I want that on the top 10. No, I'm just kidding. That's why I put it out there. No, um, but really that's what I want you to do right now is really think what is it that you believe is a priority? And what I would also look at and try to hope for is alignment. And right? mm -hmm. we talk about alignment with the LCAP. Can with our uh, district goals, you know, so you're not saying this is what we want, but not what the district health cap saying, right? I know you guys are all laughing at me on that, but, but some sort of alignment there, right? So it's, it comes together as yeah. a plan. Dr. Flores. Dr. Wyatt, are you going to agendize this for next board meeting so that we can submit them and then oh, well, we have I a actually, discussion? I actually hope you can submit them to Ms. Cunningham by tomorrow night. By tomorrow night? Okay. That's our goal. And then what she will do is establish a list. You know, we have five each, potentially 25 different priorities, but I imagine there'll be a lot of overlap. Overlap, So okay. I'm happy to have between 15 and 20 or so something, we'll and we'll probably towards the to top her, 10. And then uh, it'll be an agenda item for yes, us to discuss. You okay, got great. it, Dr. Flores. Okay, got it. Dr. Uh, Mr. Tillman. Yeah, and you know, I think you brought up a good point. I forgot we had that. We had a, we, we had a list for future agenda items, mm -hmm. but I want to clarify that the way it, it happens is, you say you have an item you want to agendize, and you look for consensus. If you get oh the yeah, thank you, Mr. Tillman. <laughs> if you get the consensus, then it's an item that we agree is going to be agendized. Yeah. So I just want to be clear. So I know, uh, uh, Mr. Bio, you mentioned items for, and usually, you know, you would take your top item you want and say, "This is what I think is important." Do I see a consensus to agendize it? Yes. If you don't get the consensus, which is three other board members, then it doesn't get agendized. It's always been that way. So, but then you know for sure whether or not it's going to be agendized, right? You're not, you're not um, thinking there's some other process, and, and 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 it's important because the way board meetings go, and when the president is creating the agenda, there's very little space for an agenda item because it's going to increase the time. So it is going to be something that uh, we know that the board as a whole wants to discuss on the item. Once we get the list and we agenda, uh, prioritize them, and then it's up to um, Dr. Wyatt to include them in future meetings. But I just wanted to be clear. And if that's changed, because that, that was past practice, if that's changed and you want to do it a different way, we, we can. I'm just saying that's the way we've done in the past. No, Mr. Tillman, and, and thank you for bringing that up. Actually, on my notes, I highlighted it, circled and underlined it, but I hadn't mentioned it yet that, you know, when we get to the selection process of the top 10, it will be with board consensus. Yeah, it won't be well, you know, and, and here's the point where we might get our feelings hurt, right? Well, I want this one so bad. Well, I only got one vote, including mine, and that was two, but we didn't have a board consensus. So it's, it's important, one, that we are able to express our priorities but even more important that we come to consensus on items. Okay, and that might be some uh, posturing on our part or selling on our part, right? It could be, but I don't, honestly, when we did this before, mm -hmm. it wasn't that hard. It, when, we, when we picked our top 10 mm -hmm. out of the list, um, it was amazing how close they were. And, and if you look at the old list, there's only eight on there. Right. So it may only be eight. It might I not think necessarily we be dwindled 10. it down. Yeah, we it dwindled like it down. It was like 20 one time. Yeah. Or third, it was a bunch. And that's what I wanted Mr. Viles to see because there were, and I didn't give you the, the board follow-up that Mr. Tillman's talking about because it's one, two, three pages front and back. Um, 
But if you could see each branch uh, of mm -hmm. cabinet had priorities on here. And I always felt bad because there's always seemed like one branch had more educational services. Stu always yeah, had the most services. on there. I'm like, it oh, my God, that poor person. Is that Miss Applegate? Oh, yeah, see. Mm -hmm. um, always had the most priorities on there. I'm like, that's mm -hmm. not fair, but life's not fair. No, just, just, some kidding, institutional, <laughs> just some institutional history. We used to ask for things, and then it, people forgot. Mm -hmm. So That's around 2010, 2011, we decided that we would write them down right. <laughs> and then follow up. And, follow mm -hmm. up. Uh, and that's when that practice started, yeah. Because and when then we started prioritizing and getting consensus. But usually it would just like, you know, people would forget and, and we wouldn't have any follow-up. So that's, and I think it's a really great practice. So a lot of boards follow our practice, by the way, uh, because they also, people forget, you know, in case you, unless you have a process to do it. No, yeah. Dr. Flores, and thank you so and, much for saying that because, yeah. you know, mm -hmm. I didn't want to overwhelm everybody with mm -hmm. all the forms yet because I wanted us to really get this process mm -hmm. started. But uh, like for Ms. Savalos, we will definitely get her to board follow-up um, handout because, you know, the neat thing about it, and I look at my name's not on there a lot. Somebody know you listen to me. But um, you your get your name next to your priority. <laughs> and it'll say Miss Savalos right here. And it'll say like the things that you want. Because you bring them up all the time in board meetings. You can say, hey, what happened to mine right here? I asked mm -hmm. on 4720. Because it even puts the date that you requested it on. Mm -hmm. And what branch it falls under. And requested by who. And so I know you've made these lists. And trust me, this list will grow. And your name will be in this column over here. And it, it's just a great tool for monitoring. You know, what we do know is that they don't all get done maybe in a year or two. And you're like, dang, that's taking long. But this is a big shift. And I've learned that as a board mm -hmm. member that there's priorities I came on six years ago when we talked about SEL and wellness centers that were a priority to me that are finally coming to fruition, but we probably still won't reach those for maybe another couple of years. So one thing I had to learn was patience in this position, which was hard as heck. But I just wanted you to kind of understand where we're going so you can see this. I'll even give you this one when we're done so you have it. Um, so, we go to yeah. Ms. So, um, so my Daddy question, Ro Dr. Daddy Rogers and Dr. Flores, and I'll wrap up. I don't remember if it does actually say future agenda items on there. I know we talked about this, but did it, did it actually say future agenda items? It does. Item? It does. Agenda items, so we had, because yeah. that's the one I can't see. And that's this so, little yeah. form here. That I one mean, that had that future one agenda. Okay. And you could look at this, okay. you know, you can't see it, but all the gray that's on there, mm -hmm. which is half those items, are done. Yeah. Okay. And I imagine if I took my pen and went through a bunch of these, more of them would be done. Okay. So, we prioritize yeah, we those condense. also. Yeah. And future I remember, I remember we condensed, condensed, but I, I didn't remember too. future agenda. And does the future agenda item tell you when it was coming or it just said it was coming? It said what date it was requested, just so you know. So some of these go back to 819, but that one's crossed out now. So our oldest one on future agenda items right now. Would have been 420. And it was coming. Okay. That was coming. Kind of the and right then sometimes example, when something urgent would come up, we didn't put it well, on we there. Right up. We, we just moved it up. With consensus. Because it was urgent. Yeah. Yeah. And that's the beauty of this is that we it's transparent. It's out mm -hmm. in the open. And if we decide something needs to move onto this list and something needs to come off this list, we do it as a group. And, and it has worked. And that's why I'm super excited about getting back to this. Um. Dr. Wyatt, are we done with that? Before we leave, I'd like to say something. Yes, and so if you can, if you're ready, please give your um, board top 10, even though it says five yeah. on their worksheet to Ms. Cunningham, please put your name on it. Dr. Flores, the floor is yours. Yeah. Um, I just wanted to uh, acknowledge Dr. Monitis because I believe this is your last uh, board meeting with us. And so uh, I know for myself, I just want to thank you for all your service uh, that you have given us to all our community and our district and, 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 and worked with us, the good and the bad <laughs> and, the, and the difficult. And, and also, um, you know, just have always been, you know, um, uh, very, very um, present uh, for all of us. And just want to wish you the best. Uh, I think we've prepared you uh, to be a great superintendent. <laughs> Uh, and uh, uh, I'm just being facetious, I'm sorry, but uh, the experience I think has been, um, um, you know, very ample and so forth. And especially I read a little bit about Worcester. They have dual language programs. So I think that will be a great asset for them, knowing that you, uh, and also that you speak Spanish and, and so forth. And so we just, I just want to wish you the best and, uh, 
and uh, Godspeed. Yeah. Well, Dr. Flores, I'm sure each one of us could echo that about Dr. Manares and, you know, jokingly but not jokingly, if you could work here in San Mario City with this school board, you can work anywhere. Yeah. Let me just say that. But no, um, this is truly a city that requires, and a district and community that requires everything from us. Mm -hmm. And you have delivered on every level. And that's why you're going to become a superintendent mm -hmm. here very soon, um, close to your daughter. And I couldn't think of a better opportunity and uh, change in life. How amazing that is. So again, Dr. Menaz, we truly appreciate you. So ending on a great note, uh, let's go ahead yeah. and... Didn't, didn't Dr. Oh, Dr. S Mr. Tillman had to go... Didn't no, no more sad news. No, no. Yeah, come on. Just I said no go more ahead. sad news. Go ahead. But didn't Dr. Escobar... Uh, oh, but he's not geez. his last. Oh, this is not your last. But has that, I don't know. Has that been... Oh, right. That I don't, is not, I don't know. Stop. Dr. Escobar, is this no, your no, last? No, 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 no. No, 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 no. That's not out yet. No, okay. Oh, not yet. So next board meeting, we'll talk a little bit about great things of accomplishments of other folks that we get a chance to, but... Let's go ahead, Mr. Tillman. This is your favorite part of the meeting. Yeah. And you will be missed. Move to adjourn. <laughs> All right. Second. We have a move and a second. Thank you, everyone. Right. Great meeting. I know we went a little bit over, um, but we always have great questions. That's why. And even better answers.